This is Tom Cold Export, and today we are testing which CPU you should go for if you are into competitive shooter games such as Warzone, Battlefield, and Fortnite. So in this video, I figured we'd you know do a bit, bit of benchmarking, see which CPU performs the best for competitive shooter titles, because I'm sure some of you play those quite a lot. Uh, the two headliners I got today are the Intel Core i5-13600K and the AMD Ryzen uh, R5-7600X. Apart from that, we also have the i5-10600K, the i5-11400, the R5-5600X and the R5-3600. And we are pushing all the CPUs as hard as we can to see uh, what performance numbers we can get out of them. So instead of using you know, the same memory across the board, we are pushing everything as far as we can to see the best case scenario, uh, sort of. So, uh, start off with the Intel Core i5 13600K. This CPU was tested on an Asus C690 F Gaming uh, Strix motherboard. I probably messed up naming up ROG Strix F Gaming C690, ROG Strix C690 F Gaming. Yeah, you know which, which motherboard I mean. So, the Core i5 13600K was tested with the two 6400 GB sticks of the DDR5 memory from G-Skill, Trident C5, these are Hynix A die, and they were overclocked to 6800 MHz, uh, CL34, or, I believe. Uh, and that's because that's as far as I could go on the C690 motherboard. Now, I do the sticks can do more because uh, A die apparently can do very high frequencies. And you know, I was able to get it to boot at 7400 and 7600, but I was not able to get it stable. So I I am planning to do another test on a C790 board in the future and I am eyeing the MSI C790 Tomahawk because I do quite like that board but it's not in stock at the moment so I can't really get a hold of it. Uh, and I, I have actually sold the Asus C690 board so uh, I, I'm not able to test its CPU anymore. Uh, apart from this test I already have done for this video and for the review video of the CPU. Uh, now. Uh, we also have the Ryzen R5 7600X, which recently got a price drop, which made it a lot more uh, interesting, we should say. Uh, oh, by the way, I did not overclock the CPU, because the R5 7600K already uses quite a lot of CPU, uh, power, and it's kind of difficult to cool. Uh, so yeah, it's running at stock with overclocked memory. Now that the D7600X, that was tested on an ASRock B650M uh, Phantom Gaming motherboard. Now this is the cheapest B650 board I could find, apart from the Gigabyte board, but I'm, mm, I prefer the ASRock board, personally. Uh, you will see a review of that in the future, but uh, not right now. Uh, so this CPU can boost to 5.3 GHz, uh, and it actually boosts to 5.35 GHz. And in addition to that, we are using PBO and Auto OC, which meant that the CPU could run up to 5.55 GHz to get the most amount of performance we could get out of it. Because this one uses a lot, a lot less uh, power than the i5, so it's a bit easier to cool. And uh, that's why we were able to do that. Now, of course, the memory on the Ryzen chip is running slower because of the Infinity fabric. So instead of running at 6800 or 6400 even, it is running at 6200 because that's the highest I was able to go with the uh, synced Infinity fabric and in, in uh, synced uh, memory controller speed as well. Any faster than that, then you had to run the memory controller in uh, by two modes, so half the speed, and that uh, hampers performance or at least latency quite a bit. So I did not want to do that. Um, but 6200 with tuned timings, and all the timings are tuned, even the sub timings, not just the primary timings. I believe we were running at uh, 32, 36, something. I'll have it up on screen because I can't remember right now. Then we also had the i5 11400 and 10600K. Now the 10600K was running with uh, 4 gigabytes, uh, 4 8 gigabyte sticks of the DR4 memory. Running at 3866 megahertz, we'll see a 16, 16, 16, 36 timings. And tune some timings as well. I'm not going to go through all those because that would make this video a lot longer. Uh, the CPU was overclocked to 4.9 gigahertz, which is not a big overclock because it's already boosted to 4.8 the stock, so 100 megahertz higher 
but we are pushing it as high as we can go and 4.4 gigahertz 4.5 gigahertz uh, ring speed or cache speed uh, so that also aids memory performance a bit uh, then there is the 11400 now this cpu was not able to run at the same speed as the 10600k in gear 1 3466 is the highest i could go so it was 3466 CL15 instead of 3866 CL16. So we are losing a bit of bandwidth, but latency is still pretty good. Then there, are, and those um, CPUs were tested on the Aorus C490 Elite AC motherboard. Then there is the Ryzen CPUs, the Ryzen R5 3600 and 5600X. Now the 5600X and 3600 was tested on the ASRock B550M Pro 4 motherboard. Uh, and the memory was running at 3866 for the 5600X at the uh, same timings as the uh, Intel setup, so CL16. And for the R5 3600, it was 3733 MHz because I couldn't get the Infinity Fabric any faster. And that was also with CL16 timings. I didn't tighten the timings anymore because this is a fairly small uh, megahertz difference between 3733 and 3866. But uh, yeah, it's still there. And that's pretty much it. And yeah, the CPU cooler was the Corsair H115i 280mm AIO. So because I didn't have the right mounting kit for LGA 1700, I had to use the LGA 1200. Uh, and the, the threads are a bit uh, shorter on, on uh, those uh, standoffs. So yeah, because of that, uh, the cooling was not ideal. This did reach 90 degrees Celsius at the most uh, at stock with a 280mm min 200 with a 280 millimeter AIO so that's not ideal so we didn't really have any headroom to go to overclock it even further but you can overclock it to 5.2 5.3 probably and you can uh, overclock the efficiency course as well this is a 14 core 20 thread CPU so this is actually the, the most powerful CPU of the lot in terms of just amount of cores but that's it for the setup uh, 1000 watt CPU Oh yeah, and the video card, of course. That's the RX 6800. So that's the most powerful video card I have. It's not the most powerful video card you can get, but it's the most powerful I have. And we set it at 1080p uh, to, to sort of alleviate the GPU bottleneck and only test the CPU. And we used low settings, which is fairly competitive, high textures, because that's what I prefer, and long view distance, because that gives you sort of an edge. And yeah. I think that's pretty much it. So let's get to the numbers and see which one performed the best. We start off with Apex Legends. Benchmarking was done playing three matches and recording the frame rate. This should get us a representative real world result. In this title, we have a 300 frames per second frame cap, and the result is at the average from the 5600X, the 13600K, and the 7600X uh, is pretty much the same with the only difference in the 1% lows, where the 13600K and 7600X has a slight lead. Both the LGA 1200 CPUs delivers a good experience here, uh, with the 10600K taking the best of the rest title. The R5 3600 is lagging a bit behind the averages, but 241 frames per second should still be fine for competitive uh, pl gameplay in this particular title. The 1% low on the 3600 matches the 10600K. So it still, still, it still delivers good performance, just not uh, groundbreaking. Moving on to uh, Battlefield 2042. This game eats CPU resources like it was candy. Benchmarking was done by doing three matches on the new Spearhead map while recording the frame rate. Here there is a substantial difference between the latest CPUs compared to the older parts. The 13600K and 7600X are tied on the average but the i5 has an edge in the 1% lows, giving it the lead. These CPUs were 14% ahead of the 5600X, which delivers a respectable 188.6 frames per second on average. Uh, one thing to note here, though, is that none of the CPUs tested were able to deliver 240 frames per second on average, even on low settings at 1080p with the RX 6800. 165 frames per second, however, was reachable by all but two CPUs. 11400 and the R5 3600, which are both still able to deliver over 144 frames per second average though, so still pretty good. So if you have a 144 hertz monitor, you should be fine with any of these CPUs. Moving on to CSGO. 
Here we play two full matches on the DDoS2 map, which gives us a pretty large data set. D136 on the K takes the lead with 382 frames per second average, which essentially is on par with the 7600X and 5% ahead of the 5600X. These three CPUs are able to take full advantage of a 360Hz screen, while the remaining CPUs being a good match with a 240Hz monitor, with the R5 3600 being the best of the rest. Next up is Fortnite. We are essentially doing three matches here and recording the frame rates, averaging them at the end. We are running the X12 with the latest update um, to Unreal Engine 5. On top we find the R5 7600X with 426.9 frames per second average, delivering 15% more frames than the i5 13600K and with 1% lows being quite a bit better as well. The i5 13600K itself is able to deliver 370 frames per second average, which should be plenty for most people. The R5 5600X is also delivering pretty good performance here, and the i5 10600K takes the title best of the rest in Fortnite. Moving on to player unknown battlegrounds, here the R5 7600X is again in the lead with 335 frames per second on average, about 11% ahead of the i5 13600K. The AM4 CPUs also deliver a highly playable experience with above 240 frames per second on average. GL the LGA 1200 CPUs didn't fare quite so well, delivering pretty much identical performance at 213 frames per second on average, so still good, just not quite on par with the AM4 CPUs. Rainbow Six Siege is the next title, and again we are playing three matches, each match having at least three rounds, so quite a bit of data here as well. The best and worst run is discarded, the best and the worst run is discar discarded, and the remaining are averaged. The R5 13600K is really flying here with 486 frames per second average, 9% ahead of the R5 7600X. However, the 7600X is having better 1% lows. The only CPU not being able to deliver over 360 frames per second in Rainbow Six Siege is the i5-11400. Uh, it still delivers good performance, it's just not top tier, which is okay, because it's a budget part. Another high FPS game is up next, which is Overwatch 2, that is, Overwatch 2. We have a 600 frames per second cap in this game, which is hit at times, but the average for both the 13600K and the 7600X is on par with it, each other, as are the 1% lows. The 7600X is 14% ahead of the 5600X here, not that you should feel the need to upgrade for Overwatch, as even the 3600 is delivering over 300 frames per second on average. The last game tested is Warzone 2, and here the i5 13600K has a clear lead, delivering over 200 frames per second on average at 207.9. That's 13% more frames on average than the 7600X. And Warzone appears to have a preference for Intel CPUs, seeing as both the LGA 1200 CPUs are essentially on par with the 5600X, and the R5 3600 is uh, failing to deliver over 144 frames per second in Warzone 2. Now let's take a look at the averages. Averaging the 1% lows across the 8 games as well as the average figure, we find that the i5 13600K and 7600X is delivering the same averages with the 7600X having a slight lead in the 1% lows. The 7600X was on average 13% faster than the 5600X and 36% faster than the 3600 for the averages. The 1% lows saw a larger 25% improvement over the 5600X and 41% improvement over the R5 3600. On the Intel side, the 13600K was on average 29% faster than the 10600K and 33% faster than the 11400. For the 1% lows, we for the 1% low, the 13600K beat the 10600K by 33% and the 11400 by 40%. Now what about value? If you're buying... So what about value? Well, if you're buying new right now or building a new PC, I don't really think the older uh, 10 or 11th gen Intel parts makes much sense and personally I'm a bit uh, on the fence about the R5 3600 as well because that's also an aging part at the time. Uh, but uh, if we look at value, right now you can get the R5 uh, 5600X for $163, or you can save even more and go for the non-X version for $136. The 5600 will be slightly slower than the 5600X, but not by much, like 5% maybe. 
uh, or you can get the R5 3600 for 114 uh, dollars although I, personally I would prefer the 5600 over the 3600 uh, even even at the price premium the 76 on the X uh, has recently received a price cut and is, is now $240. That's pretty good. And the i5-136 on the K is $320. And for what that CPU is, that's actually also a pretty good deal. I've included an estimate for the R5-5600 at 95% of the performance of the 5600X. Uh, so the aging uh, AM4 CPUs are taking it away here for value. The R5 3600 at $114 is the CPU that delivers the most frames per dollar spent if you only look at the CPU and not the motherboard or the memory. Next up is the estimated R5 5600 at $136 or $37, followed by the 5600X. The i5 1300K is the worst value when talking frames per FPS at 1.09 average FPS per dollar. And the 7600X is actually quite a bit better here at 1.47. But even that is not close to the value that the AM4 CPUs offer. If we had used total system cost with memory and motherboard price, the AM4 CPUs would come even better off here with excellent, excellent budget boards, such as the B550M Pro 4 from ASRock for around $100. So in conclusion then, you don't really need a new CPU. If you spend some time tuning your CPU and your memory, you should be able to get uh, pretty good frame rates in most competitive shooters. So if you are looking to game at 144Hz at 1440p uh, at competitive settings, so that's pretty low settings, I'd recommend the uh, 6700XT, 6600XT should also be okay, or a used 5700XT should also be able to deliver over 144 frames per second on, at competitive settings in most competitive shooters. But what about the i5-13600K? Well, if your main priority is gaming, I'd probably point you towards the Ryzen CPUs instead, uh, depending on your budget, of course. If you have a pretty tight budget, AM4 CPUs are still pretty good and should be fine for years to come, and you still have a bit of an upgrade path to the 5800X3D if you want the best gaming part on that platform. Uh, other than that, I do think this 7600X is actually a fairly reasonable uh, CPU at the moment. You don't get the uh, CPU performance that you do with the i5-13600K, but uh, you do get similar gaming performance. And if that's your priority, then you might want to consider the 7600X because uh, AMD also has a good reputation with uh, supporting their sockets for a lot longer than uh, Intel, which is usually just two generations per socket. AMD has supported the AM4 socket for a lot of years and four, four generation CPUs, uh, four and a half if you count the 5800X3D, I suppose. Um, that's twice the amount. Now, of course, we don't know if the AM5 will be supported uh, just as long as AM4 was, and probably it will not, but time will tell. Even so, you should at least get three generations, I think, on the AM5 uh, platform. I do believe they have said they are supporting it to 2025. So yeah, three generations around that, one more than Intel. And, and, and the other thing you also have to keep in mind, of course, is that these 13 generation Intels are on LGA 1700, which is a dead platform. So, uh, well, probably a dead platform. So next generation CPUs from Intel will require new motherboards, while next generation CPUs from AMD should not require new motherboards. But of course, you might not build your computer with the intention to upgrade it in a couple of years. Maybe you want to upgrade it in five years or seven years or something. And that's perfectly fine. The i5 13600K should be plenty CPU for years and years and years to come. So it all depends on your budget and your priorities, I think. If you are going 13 Gen Intel, I would personally go DDR5. I would not go DDR4. And of course, if you are going AM5, you have no choice because they don't support DDR4, then you have to go with AM4 instead. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. The conclusion is that you don't need a new CPU unless you are on a 6600K or a 7700K. Yeah, you don't need a new CPU. Goodbye.